world's number one in terms of economic dynamism, so what could be more relevant? In a minute, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing the uh, number one minister of business, that's Matthew Hancock, and also the two chairmen of our two panels, Fraser Nelson, who is a distinguished director of the Center for Policy Studies, and he will chair, the, he will chair that panel, and Ian Martin, who is the remarkable editor in chief of CapEx, who will chair the second panel. As you all may know, the Free Market Roadshow is the creation of the Austrian Center of Economics, and it's a remarkable bringing together of 60 think tanks from around the world, which the CPS is very pleased to be one. And um, it's taking this roadshow to 35 countries, and it's a remarkable feat and a great cause, and one which we share very closely with them. In a minute, I'm going to introduce you to the Austrian ambassador himself, Dr. Reitinger, and then I'm going to have the pleasure of asking the, the chairman elect of the Institute of Directors, Lady Judge, one of the most distinguished figures in British business, to come and speak to us and perhaps tell us a little bit about what she plans to do with this uh, awesome institution. Before I do ask the ambassador to come forward, I wonder if I could lay before you uh, a, ch a challenge for this gathering. As, as you are you're all here in the cradle of civilization, you've arrived at the perfect time in the middle of a democratic general election, and you're in the presence of the most sophisticated electorate in the world, you will note that this is, according to the polls in Britain, going to be the second time that there is no clear winner in a British general election and that we will have, so we're told, a hung parliament, another coalition, uh, etc. And you will all be puzzled by why that is, on the basis that one would have thought that people who speak for a small state, low tax, free markets, independence, individuality, self-determination, you would have thought that these would be the winning arguments and therefore there'd be no doubt about who would win the British general election. Um, apparently that's not the case. And the CPS authors and researchers some time ago worked out why that was. Because they studied all this data that's now available and they found out that when you see whichever party of the main parties leads on a particular issue, whether it might be crime or immigration or schools or anything, <laughs> Um, you usually see that reported as the lead between one party and another. What's much less reported is what goes on with all the rest of the people. And the, what goes on with them is that they don't say, uh, don't know, in relation to who has the best policy. The word they use is leader. Therefore, this um, tendency to hunt problems and coalition if the polls are right, and we really hope that won't be the case, but if that is the case, then there you are. There is some rationality in this very sophisticated electorate, and that's what they currently think. So there is no doubt, is there, that the, that the CPS has been right to try to uh, create and develop CapEx for popular capitalism. There's no doubt that the free market will show, and the whole great history of Austrian economics is correct. They are doing the right thing in order to take this faith around the world. We all, we all have had to accept, and it's been the basis on which the CPS conducts itself, and that's also the CapEx, that uh, damage has been done to the reputation of uh, the free markets and free market capitalism as a result of the recession and the um, great collapse that we saw. And we can see that that has raised up moral and intellectual questions which the, this brilliant debate show and this, the brilliant CPS I said myself on behalf of our brilliant director to not, that we are going to um, try and tackle. I hope I can put that before you as a challenge for this gathering and for the, this um, whole seminar and perhaps this whole road show. Um, we, we would like to have a situation in which our founder 
Margaret Thatcher was wrong and was convincing when she said, if you want a bigger slice of cake, the best thing to do is bake a bigger cake. It would be very nice if one could persuade the British public that the system that we are proposing here today is the right system to do that and not any other alternative. So I think that's why we're all here. It's marvelous to see you, and I hope you have a, have a wonderful time. May I please introduce Dr. Eitinger, the Austrian ambassador. Lord Saatchi, Lady Judge, Dr. Kolm, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a distinct pleasure and honor for me to welcome you to another edition of the Free Market Roadshow, which the Austrian Economic Center has been organizing since 2008. In cooperation with over 60 leading think tanks and universities across Europe and the Caucasus, and in association with many international partners, the Roadshow will, as was already mentioned, visit 35 capitals in Europe and the Caucasus, with London being the sixth stop on the journey. Earlier this year, we learned, with great joy, that the Austrian Economic Center, uh, its sister institution, the Hayek Institute in Vienna, has been ranked among the top think tanks in Europe in the 2014 report of the University of Pennsylvania, and I would like to take this opportunity to express uh, my sincere congratulations uh, to Dr. Barbara Kolb, the chief organizer of the Free Market Roadshow on this very special achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, most European countries have still not returned to the growth rates which they knew prior to the worst economic crisis in decades. All governments struggle to secure sustainable and robust economic growth. In order to achieve this goal, major efforts are being undertaken to promote innovation and to support research and development. What our economies need is entrepreneurial spirit, or as Joseph Schumpeter put it, creative destruction, which he called the essential fact about capitalism. Especially in the face of tough international competition, our entrepreneurs rely on the government to create a business-friendly environment. As a consequence, helping our companies to fulfill their potential in the global marketplace, it is one of the main priorities, this is one of the main priorities of the Austrian Foreign Ministry. We provide support and services to Austrian businesses at home and abroad in cooperation with the Austrian Chamber of, of Commerce. The success of the British economy during the last year with an above EU average growth rate has been very beneficial for trade relations between Austria and the United Kingdom by showing an increase in exports to UK and imports from UK of 8.4% and 12.5% respectively. The 200 Austrian companies in the United Kingdom with a workforce of more than 20,000 employees are among the most competitive in the world and in many instances global market leaders. Let me conclude by saying that in, it certainly needs the efforts of all of us to deal with the current and future challenges to our economies. To support growth and the entrepreneurial spirit on the one hand, and to create stability in the financial system and economic development at the global level on the other hand, that is the challenge for our governments. This is exactly why the Free Market Roadshow 2015 is so important. I would like to thank the IOD, the CPS, and CAPEX for hosting this event, and I wish the Roadshow and today's event the best of success. Thank you very much. Walked into these halls 
1985 when I lived in Hong Kong. And I thought it was such, I was here for a meeting because I was working for a British bank. And I thought it was so beautiful and so imposing and so impressive. And even then, I signed up to be a member when I heard you had to just be a director, and I was a director. But now I'm here, and it's a great honor and privilege to be here today with so many interesting and important people. I was just asked to say a little bit about what I hope to do when I was lucky enough to take over the chairmanship on the 1st of May. And I have three early on priorities. So you'll forgive me if I say that my first priority is women. What I would like to do, and I hope you can do, is that the next time we have a big gathering like this, we have more women than we have today. That's not to say we don't have some here, and we have a lot more than when I joined in 1985. It was just a few of us, maybe just two or three in the whole room. But I want to make the IOD a place where women will feel as comfortable as men, where women will feel like this is their institute, their directors, their place for education and conversation and learning and discussion and meeting each other and what the world is calling today networking. So I want to make this a woman-friendly place. My second idea is young youth, young people, entrepreneurs. I want to change, to help change, because it's already started, I have to say. Help change the image of the IOD so it's not just very important, very serious, very wonderful middle-aged men. I like, I, no matter how wonderful and charming these, and successful these middle-aged men are, there's a whole generation coming up after them. And I want them to be here too. I have my own son who's 31 years old. He's an entrepreneur, he's just started his own business. His wife has also started her own PR business. I want those young 30s, 20s to come here and to feel like this is a place where they can meet people, where they can be um, tutored, mentored, they can do deals together. This could be a little Silicon Valley. That's what I would like. I would like those people to feel as comfortable as the women who feel as comfortable as the middle-aged men. And then I have one more priority. It's about older people, men and women, because we're all going to be older, and the world is going now. Most of us can expect to live till 90 years old, and if we retire when we're 60, We've got a long part of our life to live. And those people who are 60, well, everybody knows 60 is the new 40, right? We're all more, um, we're more fit, we worry about ourselves, medicine is better, and everybody lives longer. So I have this idea, which is those small businesses, the ones, and there are lots of them. SMEs are the name of the game in the IOD. So there are small entrepreneurial businesses, and there are other small and medium-sized businesses that are working hard to make a profit. And then there are all these retired people who really don't want to be retired. How much golf can you play anyway? <laughs> they would like to work. They would like to do something important that maybe probably don't have to. Maybe they are lucky enough to have a good pension, but still they want to be useful. And my hope is that we can take all those people who are refugees from the golf course and match them up with some of these small businesses that maybe can't afford a first class financial director, but there's a financial director who's retired over here, we can put them together. We can put them together, and my opinion is that this business has to pay those people, that you don't get out of bed ordinarily, you're not gonna feel valued and you have to be paid. But you don't have to be paid those big salaries that people are being paid now. You have to be paid enough to make it worthwhile. So that interrelationship between older, retired people with skills and wisdom and judgment, and younger or smaller businesses that want that wisdom and judgment, we should be able to put them together here at the IOD because they'll all be members. So those are my three feelings about what we might think about doing at the IOD. And I'm just feeling particularly privileged that Simon, who is the perfect CEO called Director General, the perfect, and I've had lots of CEOs, but Simon, and, and they've all been great, but Simon is wonderful because when I told him those things, 
instead of even giving me one reason why I couldn't do them, he said, right, Barbara, that's a great idea. Now, is there a better combination than the chairman or the CEO that says, great idea? So with that, I have only one real duty, which is to introduce Fraser Nelson, who I'm told is here somewhere, and is the editor of New York of The Spectator. And we all know that if you want to know what's really going on, you better read The Spectator. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, very much for that. Well, we're going to our um, the first discussion here is to grow or not to grow. Now it's a you know it's ought to be a little great that you think that a lot of the economic arguments were effectively won in the nineteen eighties when there was that great intellectual cross fertilization between the Austrian school what was happening here in Britain and among the in society. But as Margaret Thatcher so rightly says, we can never declare victory in the back of something thought over and over and over again. Now, right now, across Europe, there is a, uh, a feeling that the recovery might be working, but it isn't working in a way that helps your, your ordinary people. And um, we've seen what's happening in continental Europe, where we've got this incredible jaw-dropping rise of left-wing populist parties. Damus in Spain and in, in, in Greece, then they're in power. And this is happening not just because of an exasperation with the government, this is happening because of a belief that the free market system is not working for the ordinary person, not anymore. And that's a radical solution is required. And we are finding ourselves yet again in a position where we've got to make the basic arguments and try to make them popular. And we're trying to make them votable. Now, we're in incredible, in Britain, things are way better than they are in any country you can name on the continent. Here, we have record employment, we have zero inflation, we've got rising standards of living, um, we've got you know, petrol prices coming down, we've got um, you know, a record low of people in worthless households, children in worthless households, and yet, and yet, Davis Cameron is neck in neck with a leftist populist opposition that Willemann has taken the government, the Labour Party, from being a Blairite one was happy with the market into more of a left-wing populist one where the attempt is to shake his fist, not just at the Tories, but against the market system in general, where the word director is a bad word and then Willemann uses it. His politics is one where the villains are those who create companies, uh, who create wealth, and the role of the government is to stand and um, these businesses. Ed Miliband talks about what he would do to business and what he would do with governments. <coughs> Every person has reminds of thought this agenda which rendered him utterly unelectable. Well, we're all going to have to think again because of the way things are looking, he's going to be Prime Minister in about three weeks' time. So this is a very good time to introduce the discussion which we're about to have now, which is to grow or not to grow, from stake stagnation to robust recovery. So I'd like to invite up my um, panelist, Victoria Bateman, who is an economics lecturer at Cambridge and an expert in creation of wealth. Dan Mitchell, who's a libertarian economist, and Simon Walker, our host, who is the Director General of the Institute of Directors here. <laughs> Since I'm the first speaker, I thought I should maybe take a minute or two for some remedial economics. And this is something that, in theory, Paul Krugman would agree with me on. What gives us growth? Well, there's only two factors for production, capital and labor. So if you want more growth in your economy, if you want your, your more jobs being created, if you want higher living standards, you either have to supply more labor to your economy, you have to supply more capital to your economy, or you have to use your existing capital and labor more efficiently, more effectively. That's kind of obvious. No one's going to disagree with that. And here's something else people won't disagree with. And by the way, I'll get to the disagreeable parts in just a minute. But here's something else people will agree with. If you have 1% growth over a long period of time, 
it's going to take you 70 years to double your GDP. You can do that in an Excel spreadsheet. Take a number, multiply it by 1.01, then multiply that next number by 1.01, and so on and so forth. You'll see it takes you 70 years to double that amount. On the other hand, if you have 4% growth, you double your GDP in 20 years. And if you have 7% growth, which probably isn't realistic for an advanced economy, but we've certainly seen places like Hong Kong enjoy that kind of experience. If you have 7% growth, you double your GDP in just 10 years. Now, those are big differences. But even if you take small differences in growth, if you take an economy, whatever its growth rate is, and you simply have it grow on a sustained basis two-tenths of one percentage point faster, by the time you get 20, 25 years down the road, at least for an American-sized economy, the average household is going to have more than $4,000 of additional income. So it matters a lot. So, and those are the things we agree on. Now the part that, that's a challenge, and this gets into what was just talked about in terms of whether or not people are rejecting capitalism. What gives us economic growth? I think probably one of the best guidebooks uh, that, that's out there is the Economic Freedom of the World Index published by the Fraser Institute of Canada. And if you look at that, or for that matter, you can look at Howard Nader's Index of Economic Freedom. You can even look at the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. What you'll find is that there are certain core things that exist in all these reports. Rule of law and property rights, sound money, good trade policy, good regulatory policy, good fiscal policy. And this is, of course, where Paul Krugman might begin to have some different views. But if you look at economic freedom of the world, and what they lay out for those five principles, all of which count about 20% of a nation's grade, and then you do all sorts of, you, know, you can do all your different statistical tests, and you look at countries around the world, and what do you find? The countries that do better in terms of having the good policies, the limited government, the small state, the low tax burden, the rational cost-benefit-based regulatory approach, uh,